the end of January. Cheers. It's the end of January, so that means we are doing a book roundup, and oh my gosh. You guys, I read 24. I, I'm going to call it 25 because I think I'm going to finish this final book. So what we're going to call it 25. I read 25 books in January. I have never read that many books in this short amount of time before. I thought I was going to get burnt out. I still love reading and want to keep doing it. It only made me want to read more. You don't need to spend a whole month reading 25 books. I'm going to save you some time and tell you what my favorite books and least favorite books were this month. I do everything on Storygraph and oh my goodness, it was so cool to see all my stats. I'm going to be going over specifically my five star books and my one to two and a half star books because you don't need to be wasting your time with these. Here's a Storygraph breakdown for January and to give you a peek behind the curtain of how I've been able to read so much. This pace is not for everyone and I don't think it should be for everyone. I'm in a very unique stage of life where I work part-time and I work remotely and I have no friends or obligations because I live in a van and we travel in it full-time. Also, I don't watch TV. I don't really do any other form of entertainment. I maybe spend an hour a day if that on TikTok and Instagram. So most of my free time is spent reading. This month's stats. I read 25 books, 10,057 pages. That's so many, <laughs> 10,000 pages, holy crap. My top moods are emotional, adventurous, and reflective. I feel like that could also uh, just describe me and my personality. 75% <laughs> of the books I read were 300 to 499 pages, so my top genres were fantasy by a long shot, young adult, which makes sense, and literary fiction, which I've really been enjoying this year. This one's really fun. 50% of the books I read were digital, 8% were physical, and 42% were audio. I thought it'd be much more audio at the beginning of the month, but I've been able to read a lot more physical. Part of my like strategy of when I'm choosing books to read, I try to always have at least one like book I'm reading with my eyes and one book I'm listening to so I can go back and forth just depending on what's more conducive to what I'm doing during the day and if I'm reading a physical book I always have a digital one as well because you can't read physical books when it's dark out and that's when I read a lot of the digital ones. When I see people who read a lot of books, I think a lot of people's first question is, how do they afford it? Because books are expensive. I don't buy a lot of my books, really any of them, and this is the breakdown for the month. So two of the books I read, I did buy and own. I regret buying one of them. It was my birthday month, so that's where it come in. I bought a lot more books this month than I normally would. I do have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. I wasn't sure how much I would love it, but I've been really enjoying it. It's $10 for the month, and I bought eight books. I didn't buy. I borrowed, borrowed? How, how do you say it on there? Eight of the books I read were on Kindle Unlimited. We'll just say it that way. And lastly, I borrowed 16 books from my library. That's where the majority of my books come from if I read them. Granted, you do have to be on hold for popular books. There are a few books that I'm literally six to nine weeks out waiting on these holds for, but there's not a timeline for when you can enjoy a book, and so I can be patient. I have enough books I want to read. Let's talk about my favorite books. This month, this month, my favorite books this month. Let's not get, we aren't, we don't have, we don't have that long, but my favorite books this month that I read, these are the five star rating. Just so a little insight, I'm not one of those people that I withhold my five stars for a very like particular reason. I give five stars when I finish the book, it made me feel something, I love the characters, and I finish it thinking there's nothing I would have changed about that. I have no critique for it. The first one, and it is the only nonfiction on this list, and that is I'm Glad My Mom Died. I listened to this audiobook, I am team memoir listening for life. I feel like most people have heard about it at this point, but if you haven't, it's Jeanette McCurdy's autobiography. Auto, I guess? What's the difference between an autobiography and memoir? It's a memoir for sure, so we're just going to call it a memoir. It's Jeanette McCurdy's memoir of really her relationship with her mom and how she got into child acting. It's heartbreaking, it's fluid, it's told in a vignette style, which I really loved. I cried while reading it. Listen to it if you get the chance. The next three I'm going to put all in the same category because these were a series and they were all five stars. And that is The Remnant Chronicles by Mary E. Pearson. Oh my goodness. There are a few books that will make me stay up all night reading and these books were some of them. All had beautiful world building, there's languages involved, the characters are so lovable, and the plots had me on the edge of my seat. I spent the 
third book crying the last 10% of it because of just how how real the books are. There's some books you read and you're like, okay, I know everything's gonna be okay because that's just how this book goes. The way Pearson writes her characters, there's no guarantee of anything because it's so real. So something bad happens and you're like, yeah, that's real life. That's how things happen. And so there's no guarantee of a happy ending because that's not real life. And I feel like her writing reflects that beautifully. Like if there's one book that I'm like, hey, like, have you read this? For all my fantasy girlies out there, this is the one. That's the series. On that train, Dance of Thieves and Vow of Thieves, same author, same world. However, I feel like on Book Talk and Booktube, these two got way more attention than The Remnant Chronicles, and I cannot imagine reading those two books without the backstory of The Remnant Chronicles. The first I don't know, maybe 10% of Dance of Thieves was so meaningful because I knew the characters already. It ties in beautifully. I normally don't like books that are set in the same world, but this was less of same world and more of same found family. Oh, I don't, am I gonna cry? No, I'm not gonna cry. But like, it, it just has that touchingness of it. Dance of Thieves and Battle of Thieves is a enemies to lovers. I didn't even explain the, the first one, The Remnant Chronicles. Oh, that's okay. It's, it's also like a, I don't, I don't know, I can't, I don't know how to explain it without spoiling. Remnant Chronicles is high stakes across the board. I, you just have to trust me. It's amazing. Back to Dance of Thieves and Battle of Thieves. It follows Kazi, who is a soldier, and Jace, who is a no, newly appointed leader. It is forced proximity, enemies to lovers, to enemies to lovers, to enemies. I'm not gonna spoil how it ends, but wow. It's fun, it has riddles that, I'm not great at riddles, and whenever I figured one out, I got really excited. Uh, I think what I love about Pearson is she assumes her reader is smart, and so you get that benefit of it, and sometimes I'm not as smart as maybe she thought I would be. <laughs> Either way, it was a treat ever read. Please read The Remnant Chronicles before. I know, I know that's a big ask to read three books before you read these two. It's not required reading but I think it makes it a lot better. Writers and Lovers was a book that reminded me of why I love art and why I love storytelling and why I love writing, really. It follows the story of Casey, who is a 30, 31 year old struggling writer who is working a waitress job. She's trying to figure out um, love and navigating the grief of her mom passing as well. The way that it's written, I forgot, not that I was reading, but I forgot that the characters were made up. The nuances of interactions and the way that each character is written, they each have their own strong voice, while the perspective of the main character, Casey, has her own unique voice that there are times where I was like, well, why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. Like, of course you're struggling with this. And I was like, wait, this is literally a made up character. It's a little meta because it's a writer who's writing about writing. The character arcs are so subtle and it's a very calm, beautiful book. I listened to it and that was phenomenal. The ending, there's a description of writing that made me weep because of just how on point and raw and beautiful it was. You ever feel like the boy who cries wolf when like you're talking about all your favorite things and you're like, I hope they believe that they really all are my favorite. But I, I know I keep saying the same things over and over again, but <sighs> They're all so good. This week, I read two of the five star books, which is wild. The first one, if there was a required reading for any fantasy writer, it would be this one. I've been learning a lot about the baggage we carry into our world building, especially like, why would you make this world have toxic masculinity if that isn't going to be a plot point? Like, why are you making these female characters like be pitted against each other if that's not the plot. So I've been learning a lot about just how our own misconceptions and our own baggage get built into our writing. I think this book though is like the template of how to do it well. It is a strange and stubborn endurance. The voice in it is so beautiful and unique. It's one of those books that I read and was like, I will never write something this beautiful and amazing in my life. It is a, let me see if I can get this right. It is a queer fantasy slow burn romance it's told from the perspectives of both of the main love interests. It is a forced proximity, friends to lovers. It's very cute. It's a story of healing. One of the things I really love about it is that not only 
is it a queer romance, but the world in which it takes place, being non-binary, being trans, that all has distinctions and has a place in society there. And there's identifications and it's all just like, yeah, of, of course. Not only that, but the main character's best friend is mute and so it brings in that element of accessibility as they navigate language and people learning it and those who do and don't. Also the way the author handles incorporating different people of color. Almost everyone in the novel was a person of color and the way she describes them and has their own like ethnic identities was incredible. Like taking notes over here. So good. My favorite part about all of this though is that none of those are the plot. The plot itself is a mystery, political intrigue, betrayal, I mean definitely slow burn romance so like that's in it too. Again, the type of author that I think she thinks her audience is way smarter than we are or at least than I am because there were so many connections that the main character was making of like, oh well of course this is going to happen. I'm like, yeah, no I knew that, of course. Not only that, but I love learning new words. I think my vocabulary is pretty big. And I was looking up words as I was reading it. And not in like a, oh, like this is a specialty word that they're using. Like, I did not know this word exists and that is the perfect word for it. I learned something new today. It's been a while since I've had to look up a word in a book. Multiple words in books. I cannot recommend that one enough. I didn't want it to end. The second one is coming out in December and it can't come fast enough. The final five star read kind of came out of left field. I was in the bookstore for my birthday, Abby, where else are you gonna be? And I was carrying around Shadow of the Gods, which I'm going to start next month, and The Night and Its Moon, which we're gonna talk about. The bookseller said, I see what you're carrying, and I think you would really like this book. I'm the type of person, if a bookseller recommends me a book, Yes, I'm sold. You don't have to pitch it to me. I trust you with my life. The Stardust Thief was surprising. It is a debut novel and it is set in a fantasy world. But the world is set in the Middle East instead of the normal European English. And I love that. You have jinns, you have sultans, you have salams. All the world building is Middle Eastern. It's really cool. I really loved that part of it. It kind of starts following the same storylines as the 1001 Arabian Nights. Like just cool because it's a familiar rhythm and like oh I kind of know what's going to happen here. And then it takes freaking turns. Twists and turns all over the place. The main character is a young woman named Luli and she has her Jin bodyguard. She gets roped in to finding this magical artifact for the Sultan, being tagged along with a bumbling prince and a assassin hunter type of woman. You start thinking that I know the tropes, I know the flow of the story, and I know how this is supposed to go. It caught me completely off guard. There was not any point where I was even close to predicting what happened in the book. The twists and turns and how she wove the story together was spectacular, and it's her debut novel. But if you like fantasy novels, give it a go. It was really fun. Now that I've told you what to read, here's what not to read. Things I really wish I didn't waste my time with this month. I'm trying to get better about DNFing, and these are ones that I probably should have DNF. The first is The Night and Its Moon. This has been entrenched in controversy, especially with the author. Long story short, she self-published the first one, and it was riddled with mistakes and way too long. She responded really negatively to reader reviews. The book itself, it's distasteful the way she's handled a abuse situation with one of her own only people of color in the book as the biggest complaint is that it is a ripoff of The Witcher. I've never seen The Witcher or read it so I don't know how accurate that is but the way people have lined it up it sounds like it was pretty self-insert writing and it feels that way. The book itself way too wordy. The description and the plot itself was too long. In fact I think the book should have been ripped to shreds by an editor. Not only that but the plot's predictable. I know exactly what's going to happen in the second book, even though they were trying to set it up for intrigue. It's not smart. And if a book doesn't leave room for mystery or intrigue, I'm not really interested in it. I'm a little scared to put this one on here because it might be rated one star because I just don't get it. And it might be like a, I missed the point of the book because people have raved about this book and the author. My year of rest and relaxation. It is set in 2000, 2001, New York City, where a blonde, young, thin white woman, and if you aren't sure about that description, don't worry, she reminds you 
every other chapter, decides that she wants to sleep for a year through a medical induced coma. So she's taking all these different pills trying to just stay comatose. I didn't understand the character's motivation through it. it gets kind of revealed. Not only that, but her overall motivation seemed really lacking, and there were a, a handful of racial and ableist slurs in there that I didn't think there was any reason for them to be. I just didn't get this book. In one of my very first reading vlogs, I read the first book in this series, and I felt pretty lackluster about it, but I was told that the second and the third is really where it's at, so I read the second one this month it felt lackluster again. This is a fantasy romance that is a retelling of the King Midas story with some twists. Again, the character motivations just seemed really fuzzy to me and it felt like there wasn't much revealed in this book. In fact, I really wish the first one and the second one were squished together. I think that would have been a much better story. I just hate dumb characters. There are so many things that she was wanting to do that I was like, I don't get why you want to do that and it doesn't make any sense if you know anything. I don't think I'm gonna read the third one. A Kingdom in Stars and Shadows was actually the first book I read this year and I was really disappointed in it. It is a fantasy romance, again, that feels a lot more smut than it is actual plot until you get halfway and then it's like, oh no, 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 we're trying to do the plot thing. And the plot was really predictable. But it's fast read, so I don't know if you're looking for something to kill time. I guess you could read that, or one of these five-star books I recommended. <laughs> that is it for January. I cannot believe I read that many books. I can't promise that I'm going to read that many in February, especially since it's a shorter month, but I don't plan on slowing down anytime soon, and I already have a TBR. I'm going on a cruise this week, and I'm going to vlog some of just what I read on the cruise, so be looking forward to that. And if you want more weekly updates, I post pretty regularly on TikTok. Other than that, I will see you next week.